going to have to go old school this morning and break out our hymn books, if you don't mind. The computer decided to do an update a while ago, and it still had not processed yet. So if you will stand with me as we sing our hymns this morning, we're going to start with 526. The Solid Rock will sing the first and the last. Tim, will you lead us in prayer this morning? Now, if you'll join me in singing our next hymns, they're going to be 492 and 493. After glory to his name, if our uh, offering bearers will come forward. 492 at Calvary, we'll sing the first and last. Now we're going to do 493. Let's sing the first, the second, and the fourth. Glory to his name. <clears throat>
Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the opportunity you've given us to come and worship you today, Father. I do thank you for those you've put in our congregation and in our midst, Father, that ministers to us. We do thank you for, for Brother Benji as he comes today and he leads us in your word, Father. I pray that you would use him. I pray that he would be a mouthpiece and I pray that your spirit would be laid upon us, Father. And I pray that our hearts and our minds and our souls will be open to receive your word, Father. And I pray it would touch our hearts and we would leave here changed today, going out into this world to minister to you, Father. I do pray also for those who are playing the instruments and for Denise as she leads us in song, Father. I pray that you would use them in a mighty way also, Father, as they lead us in song and in, in, uh, in, uh, provide a ministry to us, Father. We do thank you for the ministry that you've given us throughout this church and this, this community and this congregation. Father, I pray that we be the people you've called us to be. As we reach this time in the service, Father, I pray that we would know the difference between our tithes and our offerings, Father. And I pray that we would give in accordance to your will and your word. In Christ our Savior's name we pray. Amen.
Amen. That was wonderful. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for allowing me to be here this morning. I'm sorry if you came expecting Brother Chad. I didn't mean to let you down this morning. Uh, but I do appreciate you letting me let me come and be with you. Let's uh, let's pray. Father, we uh, Lord, we thank you so much for for who you are. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and your grace that makes it possible for us to be here this morning. Father, we thank you for your word and for what it means to us. And Father, I just pray as we look at your word that you would help us to see the things that we need to see. Help us to apply them to our heart and to our life so that we can be more like you in the world around us. Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us. May all this bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. We will be in John chapter 4, and John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. John 4, beginning in verse 1. I, I was really struggling this morning. I, I wanted to go to Isaiah uh, chapter 1, but uh, the Lord kept drawing me back to here. Uh, it's a familiar passage, but I believe as we look at it, especially within the context of our our world now, I, I believe this is this is where the Lord would have us to be. So it's in John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. It says, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. I'm going to stop there for just a minute. Now you'll notice in, uh, in verse 1, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, this was the reason he left the place that he left. And you know, as I think about the setting and, and where all of this began, there's, there's no doubt there's an elephant in the room. We live in a day of political upheaval. There's things going on we never thought we would see, and we're involved and emotionally involved, and we're connected to things that maybe we've never been connected to before, and we wonder, man, what in the world is going on? And I can be as much of a passionate patriot as anybody. I mean, I have a father who still, he sleeps in a chair, maybe about two hours a night. That's because he served in our military and fought for the freedom that we have, that we enjoy today. And so for me, it's very personal. And I think, man, we, th this is not right. The things that we're seeing are not right. And so I can get, and my red hair can really get involved in some of those things. And so when we get to John chapter 4, we realize that these Pharisees, the reason they got to where they were at, the reason that they completely missed Christ was because it started politically. Pharisees came from the Maccabean Revolution. It was They had decided that, man, look, we're tired of God exiling us out of our land, and we're going to make sure this never happens again. So they had 660 laws surrounding the Ten Commandments, and they decided we're going to make this happen. God ain't going to have to exile us anymore. And so these Pharisees had been very stringent. And they, I, I went to Israel a little while back, and on the Sabbath, on their Sabbath, on a Saturday, you could actually walk up to the elevator. If you didn't have to touch a button, you could walk in, and it would go floor to floor. We thought the elevator was broken. But it would go floor to floor and open at every floor just so the Jews didn't have to touch the button. That's the day in Israel. So these Pharisees, they fasted twice a week. They were religiously stringent. And so you can imagine Jesus coming along and saying, brother, you got a heart problem. That didn't sit well with them. No, 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 no. No, our Messiah, see right now we're under Roman rule, and we know we have done everything that God would ask us to do. Our Messiah is going to set us free from Roman rule. That's who he is. We know that. And they completely missed Christ. They had made up their minds that they were good enough, that they had done enough, that this was who the Messiah was going to be. And because he didn't do what they thought he should do, they completely missed Christ. And I think now we have to be careful of that. In our situation and circumstance and in the day in which we live, I'm not an American Christian. I'm a Christian American. I'm first a follower of Jesus Christ. I am first his disciple. 
I am first a member of his kingdom, and then I live in America. Like I said, don't mistake that. I am a very passionate patriot. I love our country. I think it's the greatest nation on earth. But first things have to come first when it comes to the kingdom of God. I am first a Christian. And this is what Jesus came to promote was God's kingdom. And I think in the middle of all of this, I think we can see a lesson from Christ. Don't miss the work of Christ in the middle of all the stuff that's going on. Jesus chose to go through this land of Samaria. He said he had to go through Samaria, which the Jews in their day and time, a popular prayer. Now, First of all, where these people came from, these Samaritans, and maybe you've heard this, and, and, and I'll quickly go through it. But first of all, the northern kingdom was exiled by Assyria. And when they were exiled, they forgot all about intermarriage. They forgot that they were not supposed to be intermarrying with the Assyrians. They let that one slip. And so these Jews intermarried with these Assyrians. Therefore, they had these mixed races, which were part of the Assyrians, the Israelites, and that's where these people of Samaria lived. Now, later on, when the Babylonian exile happened in the southern kingdom, they didn't intermarry. So the southern kingdom was like, man, what do you mean? You dirty dogs. Y'all intermarried and we didn't. We held out. We did not do what y'all did. They thought so little of these other people that they actually prayed to God for God not to remember the Samaritans in the resurrection. Can you imagine hating somebody so much that you pray to God that they actually go to hell? There was a deep hatred there. And it was all based on that one thing. I mean, don't you know they, it, they could have easily looked in the mirror and said, Lord, I may not have messed up there, but I have messed up. Somewhere along the way, man, I've messed up. Maybe not just like they did, but I've messed up. And so anyway, this political, religious... Pride caused them to miss Christ, caused them to min not minister to the very people that God wanted to be ministered to, but Jesus didn't miss it. He knew what he was here for. He stayed true to that, and he went to this place of Samaria where no Jew would have ever gone. It says, so he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Joseph's well was there, and Jesus therefore being wearied from his journey and sat thus by the well, it was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. Now this lady was there at the sixth hour, which would have been about the middle of the day. The ladies then didn't come to draw water until the evening time, until the sun had set. So her being there in the sixth hour gives you a little indication that she didn't want to be around any of them townspeople, any of those people who would have normally been there drawing water at the well. She didn't want to be around those people. She was in a place of... Of, of shame we'll see here in just a minute she had been divorced four times and was now living with a man that was not her husband she was trapped in a real place of sin and this is where Jesus met this lady for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food then the woman said the woman of Samaria said to him how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me a Samaritan woman for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and this well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said to him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have, you have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, 
Believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither worship on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now this lady, uh, first of all, Jesus met her in a place. She was trapped by sin. She was trapped by shame. Some of it, a lot of it, from her own choices and mistakes. Some of it in her trappings, not from her own choices or mistakes. Now, when we think about her being a Samaritan, she was not allowed. The Samaritans were so discarded by the Jews, they weren't even allowed to worship in the same place. They were not even considered to be human beings by the Jews. They were complete, total outcast. I don't know of anything comparable today that we can even compare this to. There was a deep-rooted hatred in these people. And so this woman grew up like that, thinking this was who she was, thinking that's where she came from. Those Jews had always told her, woman, the only reason that you exist is because of a marriage that should have never taken place. You are a mistake. You were not meant to be here. But now you're here, and we got to deal with you, old dirty dog. She grew up in that kind of a mindset, in that kind of a place, not knowing who she was and where she came from. And as a result of that, I believe you see this woman living out exactly what she believed about herself. Why was she married that many times? She believed she was an old dirty dog and could never be any better than that. She wasn't even allowed to worship in the house of God. She would never be any more than that. It's who she was. And so she was living out all of this stuff that she was ever told or believed about herself. It was being manifest in her life and she was making a mess out of things. She was as low as you could possibly go. Now she was living in a place where this man was not even her husband, which means he did not have to provide for her. She was just eking along. She had no friends. She was here at the well at dinner time. She didn't want anybody to be around her. She was trapped in sin and shame. The truth about herself was distorted, and this is where Jesus meets this lady. And she says, now hold on. You're going to give me a drink of water, and you ain't got nothing to draw with. And you're talking about living water. You're talking about now on top of the well would have been stagnant water. In order to get to the living water, she was thinking physically. In order to get to that running water or that living water, you got to have something that goes pretty deep. And, brother, you ain't got nothing to draw with. And, of course, we know that Jesus is meeting her on a spiritual level. He knows exactly where she's at. He knows exactly what's going on. And he's meeting her in this place. And spiritually speaking, Jesus is saying to her, whoever drinks this water will never thirst again. Woman, if you will drink the water that I'm going to give you, you won't have to do this anymore. There won't ever be another morning that you'll wake up and wonder, Lord, why am I even here? Lord, I don't even know who I am. Lord, am I really what those people who they say that I am? Lord, am I really a mistake? Do I really have a purpose in this place? Do I have any value whatsoever? Lord, I would just rather not be here. If you drink of this water, you won't ever have to drink of that water ever again. If you will simply get on the other side of the cross, you will see yourself for who you really are. You will know that in Ephesians chapter 1, God made a decision that he would send his own son while we were yet sinners at before the foundations of the world. God knew we were going to mess up and he made a decision to send Jesus Christ to the cross to rescue us. I can't imagine that. God knew I was going to mess up and he decided to go ahead with it. Benji Pied is worth it. Man, I can't imagine that. There's no greater value than we could ever get anywhere. We can't get that value from a political party. We can't get that value from our nation. We can't get that value from our family or our friends or our church. We we can't get that value from anywhere. It only comes from the cross of Christ. And that's value that nobody can ever take away from us. You wonder how did these people, how did the Israelites, when I read Isaiah, when, when we read Jeremiah, when we think about the 70 years they spent, how did they make it through that? Lord, how did they keep their wits about them? I mean, how did Daniel go through all that he went through in exile? Well, 
How did he do that? He must have been depressed about where his nation was at and what they were going through, but he kept his spiritual wits about him, and he was greatly used by God. It's because he knew who he belonged to. He knew the ground that he stood on, and he knew where he was headed, all because of his relationship with God. That's where our true value comes from. Jesus wanted this lady to never have to do this again. Lady, you ain't got to come here at lunchtime. It ain't got to happen like that. Look, I love her response after Jesus tells her that he is the Messiah in verse 25. She says in verse 29, come see a man who told me all things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. This woman who was ashamed, so ashamed that she wouldn't even come draw water with the other women, went in the middle of the city and said, this man told me everything that I ever did. What a testimony! This man told me everything that I ever did. This is absolutely the true gospel. Now we have these testimonies that somehow surround. Jesus will give me everything that I ever want. He'll fill my pockets full of money. He'll heal all my diseases. He'll do all of this stuff. All of this stuff is promised on TV channels across the nation this morning. And those things are not the true gospel. It is wonderful when we get a hold of the true gospel. Jesus reached down in the depth of who this lady was. He revealed to her the things that are happening in her heart and in her life and that she wasn't hiding it from God. And what she saw it as, this is, this is the Messiah sitting next to me and had revealed everything that I've ever done. This means that it's not over for me. This means I hadn't gone too far. I hadn't, I'm not one divorce out from being, from being saved. It's still possible for me to be saved. It's still possible for me to be a member of the kingdom of God. It's not too late for me. It's not over. She was so joyful about that that she ran into the city to let everybody know, man, he told me everything that I've ever done. You told me that God said I couldn't even come worship because of who I was. You've always told me that I was less than a human being you told me that I was not worthy of being saved but the Messiah said something different he knows everything about me he knows all of my failures he knows all of my mistakes and he still came to drink water with me she wanted everybody to know it was a brand new day for her this wasn't gonna happen anymore I'm no longer gonna see myself as somebody not worthy I'm no longer gonna see myself as human trash. I'm no longer going to see myself as a mistake because of the, 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 the people that were my parents that chose to do something that God would not have them to do all life. Life is not a mistake. It is not a mistake. God is the only author of life. This is why we fight for it so much. This is why we're so passionate about it. Every life, every life, can you imagine? want to get off on a rabbit trail can you imagine 60 million babies legally destroyed in the country that we live in I can't fathom that how many kids how many doctors and lawyers and 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 evangelists and and teachers how many of them have we killed how many of them have we done away with because we don't want to be inconvenienced are you kidding me Precious babies completely destroyed in the very country that we live in. I can't imagine that. This is why we're so passionate about it. We don't know the circumstances of those babies and how they were brought about, but God is the only author of life, and every life should be fought for. Jesus demonstrates this here. You know, this is a wonderful passage, but it's also one that's kind of sad. All the people that Jesus could have gone to. This lady right here, all they believed in, all they had was the Pentateuch. All they had was the first five books of the Bible. All of the people, Isaiah, the fifth gospel, all the people that had the whole thing, there was nobody there that was ready to be saved. Jesus had to go find somebody in Samaria that was absolutely at the bottom of the barrel, that was willing to acknowledge that, yeah, I've, I've, I've got some mistakes in my life. Man, I, I've done things that are, that are not right. I've willfully, nobody twisted my arm, I've willfully sinned before God. I've done some things that are not right. 
And if Jesus is willing to come sit with me now, if he's willing to reveal my heart and to allow me to see that and to allow me to see the mistakes that I've made, then he's willing to save me. And that is the greatest news that I could ever hear. Greatest news that I could ever hear. I wonder this morning as we, as we think about this lady and we think about all the things, again, that's happening politically, the things that are around us, how many people, and I realize, y'all, I know, I know there are people that are full of pride that are around us that, that could care less about their sinful choices. I realize that. I know that. But there are some people just like this woman. Just like this woman. We would never really think about them. They're not going to be a part of this political fight because they, they have no human value at all. How many people that we're surrounded by just like her that don't know they're a special creation of God? That God formed them in their mother's womb. That he thought so much of them that he decided before they were ever born that he would send his own son to the cross. How many people around us don't have any clue about that? And man, that would be such good news to them. So in the middle of all of our, uh-uh, you better back up. In the middle of all of that stuff that we have going on, let's don't miss this opportunity. Matter of fact, this is how we got to where we're at. I, people can't see because they're sin sick. And the only way we get unsin sick, the only way we're able to see spiritually is to allow God to become king of our hearts, to get saved, to get on the other side of the cross, to repent, to do just what this lady did, to acknowledge our failures going in this direction and follow Christ, make him Lord and Savior of our life. That's the solution. It's the solution to our problem. People need to get saved. People need to be saved. Let's don't miss this opportunity. It is a wonderful opportunity for the church. It's a wonderful opportunity for the church to say, look, we, we are a part of this now. Look, look, we, we want to keep our, our freedoms that we have in order to be able to worship and share the gospel, and we're not going to take that for granted. We're going to continue to share the gospel. We're going to continue to tell people about the Lord. We're going to continue to give them the opportunity to really know who they are and to get on the other side of the cross. We're going to take our responsibility seriously. I believe this is what the Lord wanted me to share this morning. And if there's anybody here this morning, maybe this message was just for you. Maybe you don't know exactly who you are. Maybe you've always thought, Man, somehow I'm just a mistake. I mean, maybe, maybe you even heard your parents somehow allude to that. This one wasn't planned. Or maybe you've been talked to in ways that, man, we can't even fathom. And you're just not sure you have any human value at all. God sent me here to tell you this morning, yes, you absolutely do. You are created in his image. You've been hand-formed in your mother's womb. God thought about you long before you ever entered into this world by sending his own son to the cross. All we have to do is accept that. Lord, I accept that. I know that I've done things that are not right. I realize, man, I've lied. I've done things that are not right, and I willfully done those things. And I know before a holy God, man, that's not right. That's sin. I believe Jesus died on the cross for me, and I believe he rose again. And I want him to be Lord and Savior of my life. I want to trust him. Maybe that's you this morning. And if God is speaking to you, I want to tell you it is a special time. I could stay up here for three hours and I can't speak to your heart. That's something only God can do. And if he's revealing to you and allowing you to see these things, today is the day of salvation. Please make sure you've been saved. Don't leave this church building without being saved. Make sure you've given your life to the Lord. We're going to have a hymn of invitation, and you do business with the Lord. If I can help you pray, if I can help you enter into that relationship, I would love to. I would love to. So let's, let's pray. Father, we, we thank you so much, Lord. We just uh, we thank you for loving us. I thank you for forgiving us and setting us free. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, none of this would be possible this morning. This invitation wouldn't be possible. 
us meeting here wouldn't be possible. Us being free of our own sins wouldn't be possible if it were not for your grace. Lord, we thank you for that. And I just pray if there's anybody here this morning, Lord, they know they've never truly repented and given you their life. They've never made that personal decision to make you Lord of their life. Father, I pray that you would speak this morning. Lord, draw them in a way that only you can. Lord, allow them to have the faith to be able to make that decision this morning. And Lord, we will be careful to give you all honor and glory. Lord, we trust you with this invitation time. May all of this bless you in Jesus' name.